Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Luke study. We're going to be starting in Luke chapter 21, verse 1. Uh, we're glad you're here and pray the Lord continues to bless you and keep you as you're, as you're studying with us. Brother Bill's going to lead us in a prayer at this time. Father God, we praise your name. Thank you for this time that we have to come together. We thank you for our rest and the measure of health that that we have. We thank you for letting us rise to see your new mercies today. We continue to pray for Tiny and his family, and we just pray that that um, they would have resolution as far as a place to live very soon, and the settlement with insurance companies. Father, we just pray that you would watch over them and bless them. Pray that you be with Rosalind at this time with the loss of her, of her father. Father, we just ask that you would comfort her as only you can. We pray for those who are in route to class today. Pray for those who cannot be here. Pray for all those who are negatively affected by the COVID virus. Father, we just ask that you continue to watch over them and bless them and, and keep them safe. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we're in Luke chapter 20, uh, 21 today, and we're just starting off, but I want to tie that, in, tie that in with Luke chapter 20, because remember that the Bible wasn't written in chapters. It was written in one long letter or one long report, and that these, these sometimes cause us to separate what went on in the previous chapter with what goes on in the next chapter. As we have looked at chapter 20 and the triumphal entry that Jesus had, remember that they challenged Jesus' Jesus' authority, and he gave him the parable about the wicked tenants, the fact that the, the landowner was going to go away on a journey, and he expected his people to do what they were supposed to do. And when he returned, those people that didn't want to serve him were going to be destroyed. Uh, and so that certainly is talking about Israel uh, and the fact that they're going to kill Jesus, but that Jesus then is going to become king. Uh, and then they, they challenge his authority with asking him a couple of questions to try to catch him. The Pharisees asked him about paying taxes, and the Sadducees asked him about the resurrection. But uh, I want you to notice that after Jesus had told them or given them a question about who the son of, of, of uh, whose son is the Christ, uh, that he then made this little statement down here. Luke records this little statement for us that's made in Luke 20 in verse 45. And so I want you to notice this because I want to tie this in with the next section. Uh, he says in verse 45 of Luke 20, and while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplace and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets, who devour widows' houses. I want to repeat that again. They devour widows' houses and for appearance sake offer long prayer. These will receive greater condemnation. So in this, in this last section of chapter, of chapter 20, what he points out is the attitude of the, of the scribes and no doubt the attitude of, the, of some of the Sadducees who worked as scribes and, and that they were individuals who would devour widows' houses and they loved the, the chief seats in the synagogue and so they... They, they were basically um, uh, professional religious people is who they were, and they would take advantage of, of widows. And so it's interesting that in chapter 21 and verse 1, it says, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two, two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them, for they all, all out of their surplus put, it, put it into the offering, but she out of her poverty put all that she had to live on. And so we generally read this, and it, it's okay to, to, do, to do it this way. We generally read it, and we talk about how, how uh, gracious the widow was and how sacrificial she was, and certainly that's good. And we're gonna, we are going to talk about that in just a minute. But I'd also like you to think about this, and that is that this, the Sadducees were basically the ones in charge of the temple. And they liked the temple nice and neat and clean and kept up. 
Uh, and so they like money. They like money coming in because that's what they, that's what they would use for the temple. They would use that money. And, and so it's interesting that this little, this little story that we have here is a small little story, but it's kind of showing us how it is that the scribes and the, the Pharisees at this time take advantage of widow ladies and take advantage of those who are, who are poor and tender and uh, certainly are individuals who care about God but yet, yet they're, they're being uh, abused. And one of the ways they're being abused is here. Uh, you have this poor widow that's giving her money to take care of the temple, which is basically a structure. And, and rather than them taking care of her and blessing her and, 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 and take, making sure that she has what she needs, they, they allow her to come and, and give all her money, uh, you might say, to, to the temple. And she doesn't have anything to live on. And certainly that says something about her attitude. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But it also, I think, shows us what's going on in their culture, that they, they were more concerned about the temple and the temple getting what it needed as far as money or donations rather than the individual who, is, uh, who might be in need. And we need to be careful about that, too. Uh, I, I know that sometimes there's, there's individuals in various churches and the, the elders decide that the that you know, we need a bigger church building, and so they'll plan this this massive uh, building project, you know, for millions of dollars, and then they'll expect the church to pay for it. And I think that's kind of what you have going on in here, is you have that same that same kind of idea. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with with you know having a building and paying for it if you want, but uh, we need to understand that that puts a hardship on people, and that causes people to 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 suffer. And, and certainly, we understand that that Jesus will pay them back for everything that they've done, but there's also some physical suffering that goes on. So I just wanted to point that out as we get ready to take a look at the, at the widow's attitude or Jesus's attitude towards the widow. And, and I would suggest to you that the story is more about God's attitude than it is about the widow. Uh, also, although he's using the widow uh, as a means of showing you God's attitude, because our attitude is that if you're rich and you put in a lot of money, we go, wow, look at all the money that they put in. Look at how much money that rich person put in. Could you imagine putting in that much money? Why, that's a lot of money. And so we and, and the scribes and the Pharisees and those individuals, religious, they're looking at the amount. That's what they're looking at. They're, they're looking at, at the amount of money that, that a person gives. And so therefore, if you give more money, then you're looked up to more than if you just give a little bit of money. But that's not God's attitude. God's attitude has always been almost exactly the opposite of what, what men think and what men believe. Uh, and so that's why he says, as he's, he's looking here in verse 1, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. Now, remember, there's always been this comparison between those who are rich and powerful and those who seem to be weak and lowly. Uh, we saw that with uh, Zacchaeus who the world considered weak and lowly, uh, and, and yet uh, uh, Jesus saw, saw him as, as one of God's, as one of, uh, God's people. Uh, and, and remember the, the parable of the, the Pharisee and the Sadducee. Uh, and so God is always on the, on the side of the weak. And so that, that's what you notice here. It says, and he saw a poor widow putting in two copper coins. Now, two copper coins wouldn't even make a penny in our culture. I remember uh, uh, a couple of times when I was in Mexico visit, visiting with Raymond uh, that they were having a, a terrible inflation problem in, in Mexico. And uh, we, uh, we used to kid around when I was there that if you, if you could buy a, a Coke, you were a millionaire because their peso had been so deflated that it took you know like 500 pesos in order to just buy a soda. Uh, and so that's kind of what these two pennies are. They're just like, they're like almost nothing. So people, people looking would see that and they would look at the rich and the rich would put in thousands of dollars and, and this poor widow would put in two small cups. They wouldn't even, they wouldn't even think about it. They wouldn't even consider uh, that she had done really anything because look, she only put in two, two pennies. But what Jesus is looking at and what Jesus sees is the heart. Jesus doesn't judge on the basis of physical things. Jesus judges on the basis of the heart and what he sees. And so he says in verse 3, 
And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. Well, how in the world could she put in more than all of them? She put in two copper coins. These rich are putting in maybe thousands of dollars that they're putting in. How in the world can, can, can he say that she's putting in more? Because Jesus isn't talking about the external and what, what you see. Jesus isn't talking about the amount of money she put in, but Jesus is looking at the condition of her heart. And what, what we do always indicates the condition of our heart. And it says, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. Well, how is that? For, for they all, out of their surplus, put, it, put into the offering. He said, Jesus says, all these other rich people, they could afford it. They could afford to put in a bunch of money. It's not going to hurt them. They're still going to have their swimming pools and their, their fancy meals and their parties. It's not going to affect them that much because they have so much. They have, they have such a surplus. But this poor widow is actually giving something that's going to cost her to suffer. And I'd like to suggest to you that that's what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice isn't just something we give, but it's something that, that, that causes us to be discomforted or causes us uh, you know, to have to do without. Uh, and that's what a sacrifice is. It's not just simply giving God, you know, something that we happen to have left over or surplus, it's actually giving to God something that we ourselves would personally use and could personally use for, for the benefit of just being able to eat and drink, you might say, or put on clothing. Uh, and, and so Jesus is looking at that. And, and so Jesus is saying they put into their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. So this woman put in all that she had to live on. There was, there was nothing left after she put in the, those two pennies. She was going to be totally dependent upon God. You see, a rich person can put in a lot of money, and they're still not dependent on anybody but themselves. But this poor widow put in everything that she had, and now she's going to have to depend on God to take care of her. Now, there's, there's no place in the scripture where God says, you have to give up all your money. Now, don't misunderstand that. He does say, that, that as Christians, uh, we're, we're not to be tied to our money, and in our, in our attitude, in our mind, we have given it up, but yet uh, we know that Peter had a house, and, and we know that, that Paul was a tent maker, and so, you know, he dealt, he dealt with money, uh, and, and so it's not the idea of whether you have money or not, it's your attitude towards that money, it's under consideration, and so this woman was willing to give up everything she had and depend on God to take care of her. And anytime we depend on God to take care of us, then God is going to do his part because like I've pointed out and like the scriptures have pointed out, God is always helping the afflicted and the weak. God always blesses them and takes care of them. And so I wanted to, to tie that little story in with what he said just before. And I also want to tie this next story in with what he says before <clears throat> about the widow. Because here the, the scribes and the Pharisees are so concerned about the temple, they're so concerned about the property that they don't realize that that property is going to be destroyed. This building is going to be destroyed. This building is not the church. This, this building that we have, uh, I'd suggest to you God doesn't even consider. God's building is his people. The temple of God today are the people. So if you, want to, if you want to build the temple, if you want to build the, the community of God's people, then it's not necessarily by working on the building. It's by calling people up. It's by uh, helping Christians who might be in need. Uh, it's by doing what you can and serving others. That's the house of God. That's what we build up. So it's interesting that right after he talks about this widow lady giving everything to the temple, he then tells them a story that this temple is going to be destroyed. And I think that's showing uh, uh, that's connected with the attitude of the Pharisees and the scribes. They, they were in it for how things looked and the, and the building. And, and, you know, and certainly there's, there's a lot of groups that, that build huge buildings, you know, that, that cost lots of money. And you can certainly, you can certainly see that in the, in the Catholic Church as the Catholic Church uh, built, you know, giant cathedrals during the time that people were impoverished and, and people, people were poor. 
and yet here they are building giant cathedrals and and those kind of things and and again there's nothing wrong with somebody wanting to build a building but that's not what what uh, god's uh, plan is is to run around building nice buildings uh, it's it's nice to have a place for us to meet but what's important is not so much the building as much as it is the people that are in the building they're more they should be more our concern than what happens in the building and by the way the reason that we let you know that johnny takes care of our the property here for us is so that you uh, will be able to enjoy it and so that we have a place to meet and be able to to meet together even though right now we're in our parking lot uh, we have the building so we can meet in the building and, and when we meet in the building it's it's certainly more more comfort, comfortable than meeting in somebody's small little living room or somebody's small place that doesn't fit everybody. So there's a reason for our church building, but we have to understand that, that there's a contrast between the physical and the spiritual. And that's what I'd suggest to you that Jesus is telling us in this next section, which by the way, is a pretty uh, controversial section, not for, not for us, but it's a controversial section for a, a number of uh, people uh, today. Uh, because there is what is what is known as dispensationalism. And basically dispensationalism is the idea that Jesus is Jesus came to establish his kingdom. But instead of establishing his kingdom, they killed Jesus. And so Jesus couldn't establish his kingdom. So instead, he put the church here for a while until he until he returns, at which time he's going to establish his kingdom. And when he establishes his kingdom, seven years before that, there's that's what's referred to as the seven years of tribulation, that God is going to restore Israel, and God is going to rebuild the temple of Israel again. Uh, and then during, during that time, the Antichrist is going to show up, and there's going to be this terrible persecution for three years, and then Jesus is going to show up, and he's going to, he's going to uh, destroy the Antichrist and rapture the good people up to, up to heaven, which I never could figure out then. Uh, who's on earth but his kingdom is going to be on earth then for a thousand years and then there's going to be the final judgment and so all of that is, is called the, the dispensational view or the millennial view of the coming kingdom and they use this section that we're getting into here along with the section in Matthew 24 and in Mark chapter 13 both of those sections uh, deal with the same incident that's going on here that he's talking about and and that is that he's going to be talking about the, the destruction of Jerusalem, I would suggest to you. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and read from verses 5 down to verse 9 and take a look at, at, at some of this. He says in verse 5, And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you are looking at, the day will come in which there will be left, there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. They questioned him saying, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, see to it that you are not misled for many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Now, that's what Jesus pointed out here. And I'd suggest to you that that's the same question that Jesus is answering over here in Matthew 24. And if you go to Matthew 24, uh, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up and pointed out the temple buildings to him. And he said, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. So the, so the two uh, passages in, in Matthew 24 and in Luke are talking about the same thing. They're talking about the, the temple and when the temple is going to be destroyed. Uh, that's also true in Mark's account in Mark chapter 13 and verse 1 and 2. He says, as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful building. And Jesus said that to him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Now, the reason I read those two is because I want you to understand that both Matthew 24 and Luke 13 and, and I'm sorry, Mark 13 and Luke 21 are all talking about the same thing. They're talking about the, the, this temple 
that's going to be destroyed and the stones aren't going to be left uh, 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 one upon another. Now, as he says in Luke 21 and verse 5, he says, and while some were talking about the temple that was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, now remember those beautiful stones and votive gifts came from the contribution of individuals who would come and give like this poor widow. And so they were really concerned about how the building looked. They, they, it doesn't seem they were concerned about whether this widow got to eat or not, but they were concerned about how does the building look? How, you know, how does our temple look? How does the place where we go worse? How does that look? And they were more concerned about that than they were about the, the, the widow. But anyway, so he, he points out these stones. Those, those were also pointed out in Matthew 24 and verse 1 and Luke 13 and verse 2. In verse 6 of Luke 21, it says, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one stone left upon another, which will not be torn down. And both uh, um, Matthew and both Mark record the, the, basically the same statement. And that is that these, these stones are going to be torn down. Now, what's interesting, and, and it's, it's been reported, that uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, which, by the way, was burned with fire, that the top of the of the temple uh the dome of the temple that was over the the ark of the covenant and over all of you know the holy of holies that that was that was made of gold or had a lot of gold in it uh, as it as it says here it had uh, uh, beautiful stones and votive gifts and so it was gold and when you heat up gold of course it melts and so the gold would melt and go into the cracks of the stones that were used and, and it's reported supposedly that the, the, the Romans, uh, after Jerusalem, after the, the temple had been destroyed and Jerusalem had been destroyed, that they went in there and basically pried apart all the stones in order for them to get the gold and in order for them to sell it. And so uh, it's certainly possible that this is actually a literal event, that each stone was, was you know, taken apart uh, in order for, for them to find the gold or find whatever was in there. But even if it's talking fig figuratively, then it's talking about this, the, the system of the Jewish temple and the system of the Old Testament is going to be destroyed. It's going to be uh, gone. The, 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 the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, the uh, uh, priesthood, everything that's involved in the temple and, and involved in the Jewish religion is going to be destroyed. And so that's certainly one way it could be also too. Uh, but both, both Matthew's account and both Mark's account speak that way. Now, verse 7, it says in Mark in Luke 21, they questioned him saying, teacher, when therefore will, will these things happen and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Now, if you just read Luke's account, it's really, really clear what he's talking about. It's real clear. The context is the stones and the context is when is this going to happen? It's the, it's, it's the Jerusalem, and it's the temple that's under consideration. Now, the reason I'm pointing that out is because when you go to Matthew 24, some people seem to think that Matthew 24 is talking about something different because it phrases the question a, a little bit differently. Uh, in, ver in Matthew 24 and verse 3, it says, uh, and he was, uh, as he was sitting on Mount, uh, Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, uh, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so in Matthew's account, it seems like they're adding a third idea or a second idea, and that is this age. But what you need to understand is it's the same question they asked about in Luke, and that is about the temple and about what God's going to do with the temple, and about the fact that God is going to basically change the age, you might say. Uh, and and uh, when he talks about the, the end of the age, he's talking about the end of that period. And you and I understand that the end of the Jewish period uh, basically happened when, the, when uh, the temple was destroyed, but it started to happen when Jesus became king in Acts chapter 2, and he became king, and he gave Israel... Uh, about 40 years in order for them to repent and change. And when they didn't, then he destroyed, he destroyed the temple. But that's also called it an age. But some people take that to mean that he's talking about the end of the world. Uh, that's also what they do in Mark chapter 13, where, where Mark 13 puts it, puts it like this uh, in verse 3. 
it, uh, it says of Mark 13, it says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all of these things are uh, going to be fulfilled? So what I'd suggest to you is that the context of Mark 13 and the context of, of Luke and the context of Matthew are all talking about the exact same thing. And that is, is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the fact that God is going to destroy Jerusalem and one of the and change the the position of the kingdom from being Jewish to being Gentile. In other words, he's going to give the kingdom to the to the Gentiles, and they're going to go out in the world. and And certainly, we see today the Gentile influence in the world when it comes to to Christians. Uh, and so, it's the same. It's the same story. It's the same event that's under consideration. And it's not talking about the end of the world or the final judgment of, of God, uh, nor is it talking about the Antichrist or the millennial period or any of that kind of stuff. It's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And remember that that fits in with the context of what's going on. They looked at the temple and they were so impressed with the temple that, you know, when widows would put in everything that they had, they were more pleased that the temple was being supported than they were taking care of those widows, by the way. I hope you see the contrast between that attitude and the attitude of the church in Acts chapter 6. When the church in Acts chapter 6 found out that widows were being neglected for daily, uh, the daily serving of food, the apostles said, this can't be. We need to take care of this problem. And they, they did what was necessary to take care of the widows. And so I hope you see that contrast in these two groups, because I'm sure that's part of what's under consideration here. But anyway, so uh, in, in verse seven of Luke 21. It says, they question him, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And uh, Matthew's account says, and the end of the age. In other words, the end of this period of the, of the Jewish rule or the, the Jewish privilege of being the kingdom of God is what's under consideration. And so he begins to answer that for them. Uh, and so in verse eight, he says, and he said, See, uh, see to it that you are not misled, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the, ti the time is near, do not go after them. And so this is, this is one of those places where the, di the dispensationalists like to take this, and they basically say, well, that's going to that's gonna be the Antichrist who comes. The Antichrist is going to show up before Jesus comes, and so you got to be careful not to follow him. Uh, the problem is, is that in the book of John, in the book of 1 John, John says the Antichrists are already around. Now, it's real simple. Let me tell you what an Antichrist is. Anti means against, and Christ means Messiah. And somebody says, well, the Bible talked about the Antichrist in the future. Well, that's right, because when Jesus was around, the Messiah wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, uh, appointed yet. He, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't installed yet, so you can't have an Antichrist. You have to have the Christ in order to have an antichrist. Now, after Jesus became king, all the people that reject him, all the people that are against him, they are antichrist. And so that's who's under consideration uh, when he talks about the antichrist. But that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is just simply uh, individuals who are going to mislead them. After Jesus becomes king, there's still going to be people who are going to try to mislead people. Uh, it, it, and we, we see some of that in the book of Acts. Uh, for example, we see Bar-Jesus, who was a sorcerer and tried to mislead people uh, from being followers of, of uh, Jesus as Paul was preaching to the proconsul. If you remember, Bar-Jesus was there, and he was basically contradicting the things that Paul, Paul spoke about. He would be an antichrist, and, and he would be somebody who, who's led away. Now, if you want to know today, uh, you know, what, what churches basically teach dispensationalism, uh, one of the main groups that does it today, there's certainly a lot of, of Christian groups, and, but one of the main groups today is what we call Calvary Chapel. Uh, a lot of what they teach is this idea of the, uh, of, of the dispensational attitude, uh, and a lot of, uh, quote, Christian groups believe that, so they don't believe Jesus is really king yet. They kind of have him as a pseudo-king until he's going to come in his kingdom. Uh, but anyway, 
uh, uh, notice that he says, see to it that no one misleads you for many will come in my name. And of course they have, by the way, coming in his name means that they're coming saying they're the Messiah. And, and certainly one of the reasons for the fall of the Rome uh, of Jerusalem was because the, the Jewish people were very rebellious and they would rally behind anybody who says, I'm the Messiah, I'm gonna deliver you from the Roman empire. And so they had all these skirmishes with Rome for, for a number of years until Rome finally got fed up with it and was going to just destroy them all in order to get them out of their kingdom because they're causing all this trouble. But every time somebody would follow one of these guys, they're following somebody in the name. They're following somebody in the name of Jesus. By following in the name of Jesus, that, that means that they're claiming to be the Messiah. And so people are following him. And, and you know what? That's still going on today. Uh, that's what happened with the Jim Jones incident. Uh, in Mexico, they have a, a group that believes there's a prophet that's uh, they're called the, the, the light of the world and that this prophet then is the actual prophet of God and he's our Messiah and you're he, supposed to follow him. So that kind of activity is still going on today, but it was going on during their time as well. Uh, and so he says, don't be misled by these people who are coming in my name and, and they're saying the time is near. So, you know, by the way, the time near means that it's, it's time for, for the Jewish community to, to rise up and rebel against the Roman Empire, and we're going to become the, the, the ruling class. And so that's what's under consideration. He says, do not go after them. Now, here's what we need to remember. God's people have always lived by faith. We don't live by what we see. We don't live by what we hear. We live by what the Word of God says. So it, it doesn't matter what people are saying. It doesn't matter what the rumors are. If somebody's saying something that goes against what God says, we're going to listen to God and not what people say. So he says, don't go after them. Verse 9, it says, when you hear wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. And so the next thing that he says is that you're going to hear wars and disturbances. Uh, now, certainly during the the time from the from the time that Jesus was raised and went to heaven and established his kingdom to the time that Jerusalem fell, there were wars in the Roman Empire. And, and there were wars between Rome and between uh, the Israelites. Uh, and so there was lots of wars. But here's what I also want you to think of, think of. That was about a 40 year period from the time Jesus died and was raised and went up to heaven to the time that the temple was destroyed. And so let me just ask you uh, something for you to think about. In, in your last 40 years of your life, have you heard of wars? If you have honk, ha, 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 have, have you heard of disturbances? So that's what Jesus is telling them. Jesus is telling them that, look, you're going to go through the you know, next period of time and, and don't be upset by these wars and don't be upset by these disturbances because pretty much those are normal things that happen in, in the course of, of a person's, you know, 40 year life. Now, they didn't know it was going to be 40 years, but he's telling them, don't let those, those events bother you when they happen. And so that's what, he, that's what he's getting at uh, when he says to them, you will hear war, you will hear wars and disturbances and do not be terrified. In other words, don't think that that's the end yet. He says, for these things must take place first. So there's going to be those kinds of events that generally happen, uh, and, and uh, they, they happen first. Now, notice verse 9, he says, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Now, that end is the same thing that they asked in Matthew's account about when, when will the end of the age come. In Matthew's question, they added the section, you know, when will the end of the age come? Well, here he's put, he's using this word end to describe what he's talking about here because it's the same subject that's over in Matthew's account. So both Matthew uh, 24 and uh, Mark 13 are, are all talking about the same subject and, and the same event. And we could compare them all if we had time, but, but we really don't have time to compare all, all of them together uh, in order to get a... Uh, a good understanding that they're speaking about the same thing, but they really are. He says, but the end does not follow immediately. So when he says the end, he's talking about the end of the temple, the end of the Jewish system, the, the end of, of Israel's uh, 
thought that they were God's chosen people because they had the temple. The temple had been destroyed, and God has proven that Israel is no longer his, quote, chosen people just because they're from the race of Israel. And so anybody who tells you that Israel has to be, that Jerusalem has to be rebuilt in order for God to come back is going outside of what the scriptures teach. And so Jesus says, but, but the end of, this, of that system is coming, Jesus says. It's going to come. Just don't think it's going to happen immediately or that it's going to happen in the next couple of days. Now, in, in Luke 21 and verse 10, then he continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places, plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your, your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you uh, uh, utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute, but you, but you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish, but you're in, by your endurance you will gain your lives. Now, remember that Jesus is talking to his disciples, He's talking about the Jewish community, but he's talking to his disciples. And so as he continues to talk to them, he's telling them these things because what he wants to do for his disciples is he's trying to warn them. Don't follow false messiahs. You know, don't, don't worry about wars and, and, and rumors of wars. Don't worry about those kind of things. That's not what, that's, those are not the signs. The signs are not earthquakes and the signs are not wars. Those things are just going to happen naturally. Now, verse 10, he says, then he continued, to, uh, continued by saying to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. How many of you have heard in your lifetime of nations rising against nations? And how about kingdoms against kingdoms? See, those are natural things that happen in the course of, of our life because we live in a sinful world. There's going to be wars. There's going to be nations fighting against nations. There's going to be nations that are being imperialistic and trying to take over somebody else's possessions and somebody else's territory. And we're going to have those things because men are greedy and selfish. And those things are just, just going to naturally happen. Uh, and verse 11 says, and there will be great earthquakes. Uh, how many of you have heard of earthquakes in the last? Yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and, and he, he also lists uh, on here in various uh, places, plagues. Uh, any of you know about plagues? Uh, how, about, how about famines? Uh, have you heard about famines? And there will be terror and great signs from heaven. And so uh, God is, is pointing out that these are events that generally happen. Now, uh, it's interesting that it, he says, and there will be great earthquakes. Well, some people say, you see, when it gets close to the end of the world, or when it gets close to the coming of the Messiah, we're going to have all these earthquakes, and there, you know, and and we're going to have this huge number of earthquakes, and that's the way we know that the end is coming. Well, you know, I, I kind of have a problem with that. First of all, he, he doesn't say when he says there's going to be great earthquakes that there's going to be a lot. He said great means big earthquakes. Now, how many of you? knew that there was an earthquake in Italy last month. None of, none of us. Well, maybe one person did, but none of us did. I knew because my son's in Italy, and he told me there was an earthquake over there. Well, why didn't we hear about it? Because it wasn't that great. It, it wasn't that big. You see, we only hear about the big earthquakes. We only hear about the earthquakes that knock down buildings, uh, knock down bridges, and, you know, cause giant, giant craters in the ground. Those are the ones that we hear about. We don't hear about little bitty earthquakes or small little earthquakes. We hear about big ones. And so what's under consideration is not the number of earthquakes, but the size, because they're going to hear about the big ones. That's what they're going to hear about. They're going to talk about those big earthquakes. And he says, and so within their 40 years, they're going to hear of big earthquakes. Within everybody's 40 years, you have heard of big earthquakes, haven't you? 
Yeah, we, we, might not, we might not have heard of all the little ones, but we've heard of the big ones, you know? That, that's what we've heard about is the big ones. Uh, and so that's what he's pointing out and, and various plagues. And certainly we know about plagues, uh, not so much in, in our country, uh, but in, in places like Africa and Ethiopia and, and those kind of places, there's been, there's been a lot of plagues and famines that have gone on. And certainly we see that. And so what he's telling them is, look, these, are, these types of events are going to be happening. So don't panic when you see them happening. Don't panic. That doesn't necessarily mean that the end is around the corner or that the destruction of Jerusalem is around the corner. That, that's not what it means. It just means that those things are going to happen. And he says, and there will be terror and great signs from heaven. And so, so he points out that there's going to be, there's going to be signs that, that are going to go on from heaven. And, and I would suggest that these signs from heaven are, are signs that people are going to look at and they're going to, they're going to assume are signs from heaven that, that the end is coming. Like, uh, for example, the, the Old Testament talks about that the moon will be turned into blood. Now, uh, I know when we were having our fires in the summer that you could go outside some days and the moon would be really big when it's close to the horizon and it would look red. And there were individuals reporting that, you know, that the end is near because, look, we have this red moon up there. And they would see those as signs from, from heaven and they would go, okay, it's coming. So they would see those as the signs, but that's not Jesus' sign. That's not what Jesus is talking about when he tells them uh, about these things. Now, remember that, that he's talking to, to his disciples. And so as he's, as he's talking to his disciples, he's telling them that they need to be ready during this time. Now, uh, he says in, in verse 12, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you. So he says, before these things or while these things are going on, he says, they're going to be persecuting you. And certainly we understand that the Christians were persecuted during this time, that the Christians were persecuted from the very first time that Stephen was stoned. We see this continued persecution of the Christians. Uh, and, and usually it was by the Jewish community before AD 70 after AD 70, it was by the Roman community, but the Jewish community were the ones who persecuted them. And he says, before all these things, uh, they will lay their hands on you. So now he's talking to his disciples. He's been talking about Israel. Now he's talking to his disciples and he's saying, they're gonna lay their hands on you, my disciples. Uh, he says, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you. And certainly we, we saw that persecution with Saul and Stephen and, and those individuals. Uh, that they're, they're persecuting Christians, and they will deliver you to the synagogues. So they're going to deliver you to the Jewish communities that have authority, that have religious authority. You remember when, when Saul was going to, uh, going on his way to Damascus? You remember who he had authority from? He had authority from the chief priests and the synagogues the rulers of the synagogues to bring Christians into the synagogues in order to have them tried. And so he's bringing, he, they're going to be delivered into the synagogue. So that's a Jewish, that, that's a Jewish term uh, that, that represents, you know, those religious places of, of, of schooling and service uh, apart from the temple that were in various cities uh, uh, around their community. And so the, the Christians are going to be persecuted by the Jewish community which explains why God is destroying the Jewish community and the temple as, the, as his kingdom. Uh, he, he's going to destroy them and give it to somebody else instead. And we know that he's going to give it to the Jewish community. And so, so he says uh, in, in, verse 12, in verse 12, but before all these things, they will lay hands on you and, you will, and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. So Jesus says, before this happens and during this time that this happens, they're going to be persecuting you. That's what's going to be happening. They're going to be persecuting you. And, and we certainly see that. Verse 13 says, uh, and I, uh, it will lead to an opportunity. Well, that's strange. How is my arrest or the arrest of the, of the apostles going to lead them to an opportunity? 
Well, the answer is because that gives them an opportunity to talk about Jesus in a legal precedence, in a legal place, rather than just outside talking with their friends. That they're gonna they're gonna be talking about it in a in a courtroom. And certainly more attention is given to what's said in a courtroom than what's just said out in the in the open market. And so he says it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So they're going to be able to give their testimony about their faithfulness to God and about who Jesus is. And by the way, Paul speaks about that in Philippians chapter 1, when he says that his imprisonment ha has led many to be more vocal when it comes to the word of God. And so in verse 14, remember, he's talking to his disciples in this moment. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. So during that New Testament time period, when they were inspired, God was telling them, when, you get per when you're persecuted, don't worry about what you're going to say. You don't have to study. You, 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 you don't have to you know, get the Old Testament and start, start reading through it to find out what you should say. He says to them in verse 15, for I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. So Jesus says that he's going to give them. And notice, notice that he says, what he says, he says, I will give you utterance. Well, I thought it was the Holy Spirit that inspired them. Well, it is. Anything that comes from Jesus is the Holy Spirit, and Jesus comes from God, and so they're all together, and they're all one. And so Jesus could say, I, I, I'll do it, or the Father could say, I'm, I'm doing it, or the Holy Spirit can say, I'm doing it, because they're, they're all the same. Uh, and he says... Uh, for I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of, the, none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Just because the opponents can't refute it or resist it doesn't mean you're not going to die. Stephen died. Stephen died. But they couldn't refute his testimony. They couldn't contradict it. They couldn't say, here's why Stephen was wrong. So even though Stephen died, it doesn't mean that his testimony wasn't true. Matter of fact, the death of Stephen verifies and indicates even greater that his testimony is true. Because why in the world would Stephen die for something that's false? Or why would he die for a lie? So remember that. Just because you're preaching Jesus doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer persecution or that you're not going to be killed or maybe the loss of your property or the loss of your house. Uh, we're really fortunate that we live here where we generally generally don't see those kind of things happening, but they do happen. We hear about people who, because of their, their belief in, in uh, 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 the family relationship, that their business is shut down because they refuse to, to serve uh, homosexuals, and, and therefore their, their business is just destroyed, or, or because they're speaking up for Jesus, that they, they get fired from their job. So those kind of things still happen, but they don't happen as dramatically today in our culture as they do in other cultures or as they did here in New Testament time. And so he says that he that God that Jesus is going to give them utterance and wisdom, which none of the, your opponents would be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Now, when he says. Uh, for you'll be betrayed by parents and brothers, we have to remember that we're talking about a Jewish culture. We're talking about a, a, a Jewish community. And you know how tight the Jewish community is even today. And so if, you're, if you were in the Jewish community or you're a Jew and you believe in Jesus and you believe that he's the Messiah and he's the son of God, then you're going to face opposition from all those other Jewish people that are in your influence, which would be your parents, your relatives, your friends. Once they know that you're a Christian and they are faithful Jews, they're going to kick you out or, or they're going to deliver you to, to uh, governors or, or to people in authority uh, in order for you to be executed as a, as a heretic or as somebody who's an idolatrous worshiper, and, and you're going to be killed. And you're going to be destroyed. And that's what he's getting at here. And remember, this is happening between the time Jesus makes this statement and the destruction of Jerusalem that's going to happen towards the end. And I really believe that what is what Paul is, or sorry, what Luke is recording for us is, is Luke is recording for us 
why Jerusalem is, is being destroyed and what we might call the last straw for them. God had been patient with Israel, the nation of Israel. He'd been so patient and so kind and so gracious to them, sending them prophet after prophet after prophet. But now this is the last straw. This is the last thing. They've, they've killed the Messiah, and now they're picking on his church. They're picking on his people. And so God has to act. And so, therefore, that's the context for the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, he says uh, in verse 17, and you will be hated by all because of my name. Now, some people might not persecute you, and some people might not deliver you over to the priests, or to, I'm sorry, to the authorities, but they're going to hate you. Remember what hate means. Hate doesn't mean that they have this, you know, this look on their face that's, you know, that they're just simply disgusted with you. And, you know, and every time they see you, you know, you have this, this expression. No, no. Hate in the Bible means they don't like you. They love you less. They marginalize you. They don't respect you. That's what he's talking about, hate. And the Christians during that time were marginalized and were hated. They weren't treated as the rest of, of, of Israel was. They were looked at it as being the scum of the world. Matter of fact, Paul gives you a whole, a whole description of that in 2 Corinthians when he says, you know, uh, the apostles are treated as the scum of the world. They were hated. If you think that you're, you can be a Christian and this world's going to love you, you misunderstand this world or you misunderstand what, what it means to be a Christian. Because if we're a Christian, the world is going to hate us. It's not going to like us. They might not say so. But they're going to hate. They're going to hate us, and they hated the the Christian community before the destruction of Jerusalem, and so he says, "You'll be hated by all because of my name." Yet, not a hair of your head will perish. He says, "You'll be able to make it, even even though that's true." He says, "By your endurance, you will gain your lives." Now, remember, he's speaking to them in general terms. Certainly, there were some Christians who perished and died during the, this time, but really. Now, the hair of their head was, was, was um, uh, destroyed because even if they die, when, Philip, when Stephen died, he, he got to go to heaven and, and was with God. But I would suggest to you that what this is also telling us is that God is giving the church, Jesus is giving the church this information so that when the church sees these events that are happening, they're not going to stay in Jerusalem but they're going to leave the city and, and they will be able to be delivered. And historians of that age tell us that that's exactly what happened. That when the Christians saw the Roman empire coming to uh, destroy Jerusalem, they didn't stay in the city. They all fled. They all ran, ran away. So the church was saved while the, the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and, and and leveled uh, and and so luke is giving them this account so that when when they see this happening they'll be able to be delivered and, and they'll be able to to uh, uh continue to serve god and be his people uh now uh, verse 20 here's how they're going to know they're not going to know by they're not going to know if there's earthquakes. They're not going to know if there's rumors of wars and 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 nation rising against nation, or if there's plagues or if there's famines. That's not how they're going to know. Well, how are they going to know when to run? Well, here's how they're going to know. Verse 25. I'm sorry, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her destruct desolation is near. So. If it's not by earthquakes, and it's not by uh, uh, famines, and it's not by, you know, in their day and time, Antichrist, or if it's not by people claiming to be the Messiah, that they're going to know that the end is, is here, well, then how is it they're going to know? And he said, it's real simple. When you see Rome coming against Jerusalem, and, he, and Rome has its armies coming against Jerusalem, that's when it's going to happen. So the Christians who live by faith, when they heard that Rome is marching toward Jerusalem, and you can know for, you can bet your top bottom dollar, I'm not sure what that is, but I've always heard that, but you, you can bet it that, that 
that Jerusalem knew when Rome was coming. They knew when that army was coming towards them. I guarantee you they had people out, out there in, in the outskirts that, that would run in and tell them, an army's coming. They would know that. And as soon as the Christians in Jerusalem would hear that, they would have an opportunity to flee and run and get away. And so that's the reason that Jesus is giving them these signs. He's not giving them these signs just so they know that it's going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen. What difference, what difference are the signs if it's going to happen? Why do I need to have signs if it's going to happen? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But the signs were so that the Christians would have an opportunity to leave. And the faithful people, if they're faithful to God, they believe God, when they see it, they would leave. And so the faithful always live by faith. And so he says in, in verse 21, he's telling them that when this happens, they need to run out of Jerusalem. He says, then those who, in, who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. In other words, he says, you need to leave Jerusalem, and you need to leave Judea, where, where the, the bulk of the, of the, of the Jewish uh, community lived. You need to, to leave that. In other words, not, not, not be found in cities and places where, where you, you have a lot of Israelite people collected together, because that's where the armies are coming. The armies are going to come and destroy those people. Armies don't go out in the country and pick on farmers. Uh, armies in, in camp cities and in camp villages and surround villages and surround cities. So flee from those places. Don't just stay in there. Don't just stay in Jerusalem, but flee. Now, what you have to remember is the Jewish community wanted to fight Rome because they really thought that God was on their side and they thought God was going to uh, was going to win. And and, and the the uh, the war was about three years. The 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 Jewish Roman war was about three years. And so rather than, than people hanging around, he says, flee, get, you know, get out of the way, uh, uh, leave. And that's why he says in verse 21, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains and those who are in the midst of the cities must leave. And those who are in the countryside must not enter a city because these are the days of vengeance so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Now, he says, these are the days of vengeance. Now, the Bible says that Christians are not to take their own, their own vengeance, aren't we? Well, why not? Because God's going to take vengeance. And God is taking vengeance on Jerusalem for every prophet they ever killed, for every martyr they ever martyred. God is bringing vengeance on Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is falling because God is punishing them and God is avenging his faithful. And that's why they're falling. And so let me just cover these last two verses here real quick, and then we'll end. Verse 23 says, Woe to those who are pregnant and, and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And, and so notice that he's talking about people who, who, have, who have physical conditions where it might be difficult for you to maneuver and, and to leave. If you're pregnant and you have to run, you're going to have a hard time. If you're with a baby and you need to flee out of the place quickly, you're going to be worried about, you know, the baby's food. And you're going to be worried about their, the, the baby's clothes. And, and, and so you're going to have, and, and you have to carry the baby and you're going to have to be running with the baby. And it's going to be difficult during the, during those times. Uh, and, and so he says, and the reason for that is because there's going to be great distress upon the land. And there was great distress in Judea and the land of Jerusalem during that time and wrath to the people. Wrath is God's judicial wrath. Verse 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So we're going to go ahead and stop there at verse 24. And I'll cover verse 24 next week because I have some things to say about it, but we have been here for uh, an hour. Appreciate all of you that are here. Appreciate the fact that God has blessed you to be here with us. Uh, let's have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you that you have always given your people a way to be relieved 
from the difficulties of this world. We thank you that you have indicated and shown us that we are to trust what you say and not necessarily what we see with our eyes. We pray that you help us to be the kind of people that trust you. We also pray, Father, that we'd be the kind of people that aren't overly concerned about a building, but that we're individuals who are concerned about your building, that we're concerned about the widows and the orphans and those people that are in need among your community especially, and that we demonstrate our love for you by serving and helping them. We pray that you continue to be with our brother a Tiny and his family, and we pray that you would bless all those, Father, who are suffering in the flesh. We ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.